Amen. Hey, guys. Good morning to you. How's everybody doing today? You're looking spectacular. Um, I find myself kind of overwhelmed this morning by this. This is just so cool that we live in a land that allows... You know how many brothers and sisters we have around the world that aren't able to, with peaceful consciences, gather together in the name of the Lord like we do? And, and I was listening to a podcast this week, and uh, one of the uh, pastors was saying, uh, it was given a, a, a kind of report on somebody in the congregation who was well-known and loved who passed away, and she was battling cancer, and he said, as a matter of fact, last week she was here, and uh, she was struggling so badly she collapsed in the middle of, of uh, service, and they had to uh, you know, take her out on a wheelchair. And so anyway, he said, I went to go visit her in her hospital room, and things were just degenerating. Uh, quickly, and, and she looked at him with like this joy. I said, Pastor, I get to see him soon. I get to see him soon. And he was, he was encouraged by that and uplifted by that and, and correctly per perspectivized by that. Uh, and he, he said to her, her in, in the grace that, that I think any pastor would have, he said, you know, I, I just so appreciate you and love you, and you really didn't have to be at church on, on, on Sunday. You're hurting, you're going through this difficult. And she looked at him and she says, Pastor, how could I miss seeing what God was going to do in the midst of my brothers and sisters? How could I miss that? How, how, could, I, how could I just stay at home? Yeah, so I haven't been feeling all that well. She was days away from death at this point. And how could I, how could I miss being with God with you? And I was listening to that this week, and it got me excited about today. Listen, I want Mountain View to be that church that is very, very, very difficult to stay away from because we know that God is here. I want, I want this to be the highlight of our week because when we get together in this room, the Holy Spirit of God is going to move, He's going to speak, He's going to be God in our midst. So I'm just kind of overwhelmed with this today. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about worship a little bit. Now worship is a, is a drum that I bang quite often, and it, that is not going to change. Um, worship is important. Worship is crucial. Listen to me. If you elected me to lead you, which you did, so too late, um, I say over us that worship defines us. Worship defines us. I, I just made my very first uh, pastoral and ministerial team hire uh, in the last few weeks here. Matter of fact, is, uh, is Christy here? I don't, I don't see Christy here this morning. Uh, her and her family moved in uh, like, actually just yesterday evening, and uh, uh, they were, so we left their house 9.30, and they were barely getting done unpacking things. So I said, hey, listen, uh, you, nobody's expecting you tomorrow. You don't have to be here. But do but you guys remember a few weeks ago, uh, Christy and Jason Martin led us in, in worship? Um, I hired her. So in the next few weeks, she, she, they're here now, and uh, her, her parents actually live with them. It's her, Jason, and her, her two teenage kids. And uh, I told her something that I hope she doesn't take and run with too much. I said, your position, your function at Mountain View might just might be more important than mine. I'm still your boss. Okay, I still make the end decisions. We're going the direction I feel the Holy Spirit has us go, but the role that you have, oh, how direly and crucially important that is. Worship is part of our identity, and I am so looking forward to what God has in store for Mountain View Christian Assembly in the realm of worship. Dad mentioned a second ago before we, uh, he took up the offering that I, a few weeks ago, rolled out for you a prototype mission statement. And uh, the reason I keep clarifying that these things are prototypes is that I am, dear God, so grateful I have until November to figure all of it out. Because right now we're very in flux, right? 
Uh, I've said before that I'm writing down, I'm, I'm, I'm recording so many things, and I, I know by its nature, by the definition of a mission or a vision statement, it has to be clear, concise, and small. And if I were to say what, what is mission, the Mountain View's mission statement right now, I might give you a chapter and a half of a book. So I've got until November to really slim things down, but, but I feel directly the Spirit of God, the direction of God, pointing me into some specific directions and goals and missions and vision because I believe we need to be clear about where we're going. By November, I will have a clear, concise, simply stated mission and vision for this church that will do two things for us. It will define who we are and tell us where we're going. It'll define who we are and tell us where we're going and how we're going to get there. And I want everything that we do to be filtered through this. I don't want us to be a confused church that, that is struggling with an identity, that, that has programs and things that might not fit with the main vision. I want everything to fit under the canopy of purpose and identity and God is making that clear. I'm so excited about it. I'm so, I covet your prayers. Uh, the weird thing about this whole process is, you know, I've, I've said it a few weeks ago as well, there until November 11th, is it, Dan? Your last, last Sunday? Until November 11th, there is one lead pastor of this church, and he's sitting right there. It's not me. His way is our way. His voice is the voice. But in this, in this kind of transition period, there, there's a shifting of a mantle of responsibility that I feel very heavily and joyously. Like, the cool, and let me just kind of plug this out there. Um, if God calls you into positions of influence and leadership, spiritually speaking especially, jump at it because it's so cool to see what God does in you. Don't be afraid of stepping into roles that God might be putting you into because he always equips those he calls. Leaders out there, Felicia, yeah? Do you, you feel equipped to be the Impact Girls Ministry leader around here? Don't you shake your head right now, girl. You completely derail what I'm saying. You know better. Anybody else braver than Felicia out there? In charge of me. God speaks to you and, and helps you do what it is he's called you to. And I feel that and I love that. And listen, we got some really, really good days ahead of us. Some really good days ahead of us. So our mission statement is to, is, is it to define us, to show us how we get where we're going and where we're going. And, and it, I want it to be absolutely intrinsically connected to encountering the Holy Spirit. The prototype mission statement that our pastor read a, a few minutes ago had to do with the, the correct and consistent teaching of Holy Scripture of God and the encounter and interaction with His powerful Holy Spirit. We need to meet with God. Um, let me phrase it this way. Church, it's the lamest hobby in the world. It's a lame hobby. If we're not here to meet with God, then seriously, this is kind of silly. Right? Let's, let's just be honest. It's kind of silly if God's not involved in it to come here and listen to a few songs and stand and clap. And if we're really super brave, we do like the half raise of our hands, you know. The crazies among you are like out here, you know, the, the, the moderates here. And then, then if you're really, you know, if you're just entering into that, so it's kind of like this right about waist level, you know. And then to sit down after that and, and, and give some money, <laughs> And then listen to some guy yell at you for about 40 minutes. It's, it's a lame hobby. So I don't want to do this if God isn't here. But he is. And he's going to be in ever-increasing capacity. I speak that over you with the power of prophecy behind it. Our God is going to do amazing things in our midst. 
This room will be defined by freedom and joy and worship and encounter. This is what God is calling us to be. This is who we are. This is who we're becoming. Buckle up. It's going to be awesome. So, in thinking about these, these mission statements, trying to define exactly where we're going, I'm listening to a lot of mission statements of other churches. And there's this church down in, uh, in Texas that I really glean a lot from the teaching. It's a phenomenally led church. Their mission statement goes like this. We exist to bring glory to God by making disciples, by gospel-centered worship, gospel-centered community, and gospel-centered service. And I like that. And so when I roll out Mountain View's mission statement, don't think I'm a genius that knows how to phrase these things beautifully. I'm most likely stealing from a lot of people, <laughs> making it my own. So I like that part of this mission. And it, this, this mission statement for this church in Texas is informing the talks that I'm going to give you this Sunday and next Sunday. Uh, specifically in two of their categories, I'm going to talk to you about worship, and then next Sunday, I'm going to talk to you about service. Um, the beginning part of that mission statement goes, we exist to bring glory to God. Yes, no, agree, maybe, kind of, sort of? Okay, let me ask you this. Does everyone exist to bring glory to God? Everyone? Adolf Hitler. Okay, there, there are certain battles that you choose in life and certain hills that you choose to bleed on or not. Whether or not we are put on this earth to bring glory to God is one that I refuse to fight because I will not win. It's absolutely true. Every person in existence, past, present, and future, has been born to bring glory to God. Glory to God. But what about, what about those, uh, those guys that... Uh, that hate God? What, what about turning on television and American culture nowadays and, and hearing the predominant voices of our media really railing against all things having to do with God? I watched a clip a few days ago where uh, somebody, this is old news, it was from a while ago, this is, I'm sure you heard about this months, maybe even a year ago or so, but there's this uh, commentator on this news program, and somebody had taken a picture of a group of evangelicals in President Trump's office praying over him, and, and they, his head was bowed, and there were arms coming into the to the frame and, and touching him, and, and these news commentators were flabbergasted at this practice. I mean, all they kept, the, the one, one in particular kept going, this is just weird. Like, I mean, they're touching him. Their eyes are closed. Their heads, this is weird. Okay? And I'm, I'm listening to this going, wow, prayer is an integral foundational part of my existence. And, and our culture says, this is just weird. So a lot of people take it even further and they're, they're antagonistic toward God. They're, they're not just atheists, they're anti-theists. Are those people born to bring glory to God? Uh, up on the screen, you'll, you're going to see uh, Romans 14, 11. And it says, For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. The chief end of man is to bring glory to God. You will glorify God with your willing submission, or you will glorify God as an object of his justice. I don't like saying that. That's going to ruffle a lot of feathers, especially in today's day and age, in today's culture. But don't be fooled. Those of us who have shaken a fist at a God who supposedly does not exist, even that rage against God serves as an object of his justice and will bring glory to his name. He says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. There's going to be two different types of bowing and confessing. There's going to be those of us who do it, do it in glad submission and with joy and with victory and say, you're God. And then there's going to be a whole other crowd that will be forced to their knees and say, I hate that you're God. But every knee will bow. 
every tongue will confess. So if that is the chief end of all mankind to bring glory to God, I want to be in the former camp that says, I will do it gladly. I will do it consistently. I will do it with great joy, with great hope, with great faith, with great expectation. I get to say you're God. Oh, I get to find my identity in being a man that says you are God above all, in all, through all, past, present, and future. You always have. You always will be. Nothing shakes you off the throne. You are God. And I want us to be a church that proclaims that joyously. Joyously. So if we will bring glory to God, the question to be asked is how? How? I would say worship and service are two huge categories in how we bring glory to God Almighty. Worship and service. And, and I want you to, I'm going to give a plug for next week because, listen, if I come in to preach next week and only half of you are here, I'm taking a mental note right now. Who's here and who's not? I'll call you. Dude, I, I will send Jennifer out, our office administrator, to your house for an explanation. Okay? When, when we talk about service, I, I, I want us to put it into the context that this is a really beautiful thing to serve God, to bring glory to God by serving Him and serving others. We, we are going to be a service church because I want your joy, and joy is found in serving God and serving others. Another thing I want to address, and I'm going to spend more time on it next Sunday, is... Um, the generations in this church. I had somebody very innocently and, and beautifully say to me uh, that they wondered if their time was kind of done, if their turn had passed in this church because they're a little bit closer to, to our outgoing pastor's age. <laughs> exactly. We keep talking about being a family here. Gray hairs, I need you. I need you. Your time is not done. Your turn is not over. Listen, I, I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of people who, I mean, I, it would be weird for me to go to a church for maybe 30 years being pastored by a guy who, who looks very similar to me in age demographic, and all of a sudden they hand it off to a whippersnapper kid that doesn't know anything. I'm like, oh, well, here we go. Let's see how, how this is. I might just sit back and be a little bit observational as well, but don't you dare. I need your wisdom. God's going to give me the wisdom that I need to lead and to lead well, but you've got what I don't have. You've got what I need. And I need us all to step up. Your time is not done. Time is not done. Let's go into this next phase together as a family. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm in this weird category. Middle-aged is just a weird thing. It just is, all right? Because the millennials out there look at me like I'm ancient, one foot in the grave, and then the baby boomers look at me like I'm a stupid kid wet behind the ears. It's just a weird thing to be the age that I am. But I think that, that that's actually a great launching point to pull in all generations. All generations. So I need you. We're going to explode in joy and in service. And I didn't mean to take that long with it right now, but I'm going to expound on that later on uh, next week. But I want to talk to you about worship today. If our chief end goal is to bring glory to God, worship is absolutely primary, foundational, and integral to that process. We will be a worshiping church. Now, what is worship? When I talk about worship, what do you immediately start thinking about? Come on. Singing, right? Singing three songs, clapping some hands, raising some hands. That, that's, that's worship, right? Um, the bottom line is, 
worship goes so, that's a form of worship, but worship goes far beyond that. As a matter of fact, here's what I want to say. I invite worship into this right here, right now. Can you worship God sitting there listening to a guy talk to you? Can you? How about you give it a shot? Let's do it. I worship God with everything that I do, everything that I hear, everything that I say, every mental position I put myself in. It is an act of worship. Worship goes far, far beyond singing a few songs and maybe or maybe not lifting up hands. We are hardwired to worship. Every single, you will worship something. Because it is hardwired into your DNA, into the human experience, to extol something that's bigger than you. And maybe, just maybe, you worship your own desires. What a pathetic target for worship. That whatever I want, I get. I worship, I extol, I lift up as more important than even me. My desires, I want, I want, I want, I want. Maybe we worship money. Maybe money's more important than we are. I don't know, there are so many of us out there that money's even more important than our families are. How ridiculous is that? Maybe we worship popularity. How many likes can I get on Facebook? And how many posts can I get on Instagram? And all this social media insanity that has absolutely infested our environment. It's a worship of self. It's a worship of popularity. It's a worship of opinion. And our worship will only reach its fruition and its fulfillment when targeted at the right thing, and that is Almighty God. I worship God alone. Everything else is secondary. Everything else is secondary. And why do I do that? Why, why, what, what are the, some of the things that we get from worship if we are a worshiping church? I'm going to talk to you about exactly what worship here, is here in a second. But first of all, what, what are some of the things we get? We get the very presence of God. Did you know that God is attracted to worship? Why do we think that is? Every one of us is built with this sense of home and comfort. I, 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 was, I was gone at Bible college for my first semester. I was, I was at this place in, uh, in Florida, and uh, I was living in the dorms, and part of that was fun, but part of it was just horrible. I mean, dorm life, dear goodness, God bless. Everybody has to walk through that horrendous experience. Um, but I was, I was in these dorms, and uh, my grandmother, who lived in Cleveland, Ohio, flew me to uh, Cleveland for Thanksgiving that year. And so, so I flew up there, and I remember I was in the, uh, what used to be my great-grandmother's bedroom. Everybody else had gone to bed, and I was laying in bed and just reveling in the quiet. Like, oh my goodness, I don't hear thumping music coming through the wall at 2 a.m. in this place. Oh my goodness, I'm surrounded by, by, like I have my own bathroom to use. I don't have to share it with 50 other guys in the morning, right? I, I, I'm, I felt at home. I remember sitting there in that bed going, this, this is home. This is what home feels like. This is, this is comfortable to me. This is what I want. This is what I want to have in my life. I want to be at home surrounded by family and, 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 and celebrating the holidays. It just felt good. I felt in that moment so centered and so happy because that home thing inside of me was being stroked. That comes from God because God has it himself. What does the Bible tell us about the environment that God is in? Right here, right now, the book of Revelations tells us about these worshipful beings created and existing in the throne room of God whose sole purpose is to cry out to him unendingly and unceasingly, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. Again, holy, holy, it, forever this is going on in the throne room of heaven. God, by his very nature, is being worshipped. It's his home. It's where he's the most comfortable. So when we recreate that environment, that culture. The Holy Spirit of God looks down from heaven and goes, that looks like my home. That room, look, look around you right now. This is, this is just a room 
made of building materials and fabric and drywall and paint and yada, yada, yada. This temporary, fleeting, perishable room can house the home of God. It can be lifted up in this place as God. This, you're welcome here. You're welcome here. You're welcome. And when the atmosphere shifts in worship, it becomes more like heaven. And God goes, I think I'll hang out there for a while. That's on us. We choose that. We facilitate that. We make that happen or not. Oh, dear God, I want this to be God's home. I want everything inside of me to scream out, whether I'm saying it audibly or not, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. Come to your home, Jesus. Come to your home, Jesus. Sit on the throne in this place. Sit on the throne in my life. We will worship you here. We will worship you here. We will create an atmosphere of heaven. Psalms 22 says, He inhabits the praises of his people. He inhabits them. He doesn't just like hearing them. The Bible tells us he lives inside the worship of his people. Jesus himself said in Matthew 18, when you come together in my name, behold, I am there with you. <laughs> He's attracted to worship. He's attracted to worship. He is glorified. He is at home. And we give glory to his name in worship. And it's good for us to, to choose that. And some, somebody I heard somebody say one time that, you know, why, why doesn't God show up in bodily form, like, like in an actual physical appearing when we worship him? Because it's kind of like, it was a misinterpretation of some of the verses I just read you. Um, and I heard it explained very easily this way, because there's something about worship that he loves being voluntary as an act of our will. And if God were to show up right here, right now, every single one of you, would extravagantly worship involuntarily. That's, that's just, that's heaven. I mean, don't think for a second that when you see him, you're going to be able to stand on your own merits, on your own two feet, and be like, meh, not impressed. You will drop to your face and worship because he's God. Every single time somebody comes across God in this book, they fall to the ground as if dead or die. So why doesn't God show up in bodily form, just in spirit? Because he loves when we choose to worship. When I choose to say I worship you over everything. When we choose to say I put everything on the back burner and I worship God. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing. We will be a church of worship. We will be a church of encounter. Because encounter changes. And when we encounter the Holy Spirit of God, your life changes. Your mind changes. Your behavior changes. Your beliefs change. We will be a church devoted to the worship because worship precipitates encounter and encounter precipitates worship. It's a beautiful loop. Beautiful. Worship unlocks power. On the screen, you'll see Psalm 34, 3. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Uh, what does magnify mean? Simply to make bigger. Do we have an ability to make God bigger? No, but we, got, we have an ability to focus. Okay, a, a really cool example that, that illustrates this point. Um, anybody out there as a kid like burn ants with a magnifying glass on a, a warm summer day? That's horrible. I cannot believe you just raised your hand. That is cruel and inhumane. But, I, okay, let's just say well, we've at least heard of that happening, right? I did it too. Um, the sun was already there, right? It already existed. But you holding this magnifying glass up in the air and focusing the power of the sun that was already existent changed some things, did it not, for that ant? Burned up some things, did it not, for that ant? We are invited to magnify the name of the Lord in our lives, in our circumstances, in our apps, our families, our homes, everything about our lives. We are invited to magnify the name of the Lord and to see the glory that is always there 
focused and powerful. Worship unlocks power. Worship shifts the atmosphere of our lives. Uh, this, is, this is really cool. I don't have these on the screen, but there are two scripture verses I want to read for you. Isaiah 54.1 says this, Sing, O barren one, who do not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud. You who have not been in labor for the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married. Worship unlocks power. It shifts the atmosphere. Sing, O barren one, worship in your barrenness. Worship in your desolation. Worship in your loneliness. And then because of worship, there's something that unlocks in the heavenlies that you actually surpass the normal. That verse just said, listen, if you, if you desire children, we're claiming this for our lives. You worship in your barrenness and you're going to pass up people who just normally birth things. I know I'm preaching myself into driving a minivan and part of that is very hard for me. But I will go where the Lord wants me to go. Psalms 84, 1 through 4 says, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. Worship. My, song long, my soul longs, yes, faints from the, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and a swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Weird. This worshipful passage and then plugged into the middle of it, it talks about a bird birthing her young. The presence and the worship of God is an atmosphere in which things are birthed. The presence and the worship of God is an atmosphere in which things are birthed. The worship of God is the womb in which destinies are realized. Worship unlocks power. It shifts the atmosphere. Some of us have it backward. Some of us think, well, I'll worship God when my life looks like something to worship over. I'll worship God when he finally answers my prayer. When he earns my worship, I will give it to him. Ooh. Damnable heresy, brothers and sisters. He says, worship me now. And then see what I'm going to do. Give now, serve now, set yourself aside now, and then you will see what I'm going to do. Why do I want us to be a worshiping church? Why do I want us to be a worshiping church? Because I think great things are ahead for you in this place. I'm asking God for ridiculously big things. Huge and I, with faith and conviction, believe they're on their way, but I also know how we're going to get there. It's going to be through worship. It's going to be through worship. Some of the best times of my life that I look back on now with my wife, and I, I cherish and treasure what God did in us in those seasons were the most horrifically painful seasons of my life that I learned to worship him, writhing in pain on a bathroom floor. I learned to worship him when it looked like my life was over. I learned to worship him no matter what. And it's unlocking things now. My wife said something beautiful on the way to church this morning. We're, we're driving in and she goes, <laughs> just out of nowhere. We need to remember that good days are on their way when we go through bad days again because this season is pretty awesome. <laughs> yes and amen. The worship of God will forever be found on my lips. I worship him because he's worthy, because it unlocks power, 
It unleashes destiny. It births births things that need to be birthed. I will sing, O barren one. (laughs) I will sing on dark days. I will worship him. And it's not just songs. Songs are a beautiful expression of worship. I, I feel that some people might listen to what I'm saying. I want all of those things. I want that. So what do I have to like have Hillsong playing on a loop on my phone all day long? No. The Apostle Paul, Paul encourages us to pray without ceasing. Is that physically possible if we define prayer the way that we do in enunciation, a conversation with God? How in the world can I pray without ceasing when I got to get other things done? It's a position of my heart. I'm always in communication with him. I'm plugged in. Worship is the exact same way. We're always worshiping. We're plugged in. We're plugged in to extolling him, to saying, you are more important than I am. Your ways are higher than my own. I worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords because I will deliberately and consciously bring glory to your holy name here. Romans 12.1 says this, this is on the screens as well. I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. This is going beyond singing songs right now, isn't it? A living sacrifice. See, the scriptural context of sacrifice when these words were written is a priest of God takes a lamb, slaughters it, puts it on an altar and says, I sacrifice this for my sins, God, to glorify you because your mercy is worth so much. It's costly. It's life and death. So this is a symbol. This is a symbol of how important you are to me. It costs blood. But then new covenant, Jesus Christ comes along. He himself from the foundations of the world was slain for all mankind, both now and forevermore. He is the blood debt. He is the atonement. So we live as sacrifices, which is our spiritual worship. How do you worship without ceasing? You live it. You live it. You don't go to church to worship only. You go to work to worship. You go to the gym to worship. You go on vacation to worship. You go to lunch with people after church today to worship. We are living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, and this is our act of spiritual worship. Do you realize what that verse just said? Do you realize it? It just gave you permission to worship every second of every day in all that you do. Why? Because you're a living sacrifice unto God. We lay our lives down at his feet and we say, make me a worshiper. And when I say over and over and over again, teach us how to worship, I'm not talking about God teaching us how to be better vocalists and musicians. That would be nice too, but that's not all I'm praying for. I'm saying, God, teach us how to be living sacrifices every second of every day. I want to worship you. My life is yours. I don't get to just lay it down like the lamb on the altar, right? I don't get to just say, okay, it'd be an easy thing to die for God. This is cliche. It's Christian cliche. It's easy to die for God. It's a much harder task to live for him. I want to live for him. I want everything about me to be an act of worship. I want us to be a worshiping church. Just stand with me. Cindy, if you're in the room, would you come forward? I said that the encounter with God, it it changes everything. It shifts everything. It, it, It... changes something inside, foundational inside of us that that we could try and try and try and try to change ourselves, but encountering God, worshiping God, being near God, it shifts things. It shifts things that need to be shifted. Dale, you have something? Yeah, come on up, brother. (laughs) 
You know, you guys know me, and I don't do this very often, but God was impressing on me this morning in my heart about worship, and I think it's, it's good timing. Um, I, I want to speak just real briefly to those of you who have the gray hairs. Any of you out there have gray hairs, even though they're colored? Okay. okay. One of the things I've heard, and what, what this man is saying is that we need to be in unity. We need Amen. to be one. Amen. Okay, I've heard this for years. I've heard people, especially those that are gray, like me, my age, that get upset because of the volume of our worship and the music here. Come on. You've heard that? Oh, yeah. Pastor, you heard that. We've heard about this many times in a deacon board. And we have both sides of that, that this is hurting my ears, it's a distraction. I, I want to tell you something. Moses and the, the children went 40 years because of murmuring and complaining. Okay? Good. No more complaining Come on. on our worship and the volume of the music. No more. You can't have unity when you're complaining about what's going on up here. Now, I will say this. We've tried and we've tried and we've tried, and somebody says it's too low, it's too high. We even had out in the foyer earplugs, temporary sponge plugs, okay? I think we need to bring them back because I will tell you where I'm at. As you get older physically, and there are others that are younger that physically have issues with their ears, and I'm not denying that it doesn't hurt, okay, pain in the ears when the volume's too loud. Okay, if that is happening to you, you go out there and get some of those little plugs and put your ears, okay? I, I think I can say we can provide those. Can we, can we handle that? Can we provide this? Oh, sponge? absolutely, yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> because I don't want anybody, because I was first going to say, okay, I'll bring my own, but I don't want you to have any excuses of saying I forgot to bring them. We'll have them out there for you. And I will tell you that there are times when it's uncomfortable for my ears, pain-wise, but it's very rare. So I'm just saying that if the, the volume cranks up here with our new worship minister, I want you to be here corporately praising God in Amen. unity and Amen. in oneness. Yes. Okay? Yes. That's when we're going to see God come down here. I desire to see the Shekinah glory yeah. and the glory Yes. we will be prostrate on the ground here. We yes. will be on our knees, on our knees. And if you have people murmuring and complaining, that sometimes can... Uh, limit that. Yep. Yep. So, please, please, please understand the importance of worship, and our pastor has shared that. That is something that is so critical for all of us. And just think about this. Just think about this. That okay, for 30 minutes you have to endure this. Okay, out of a, an entire week, I believe there's 720 hours in one week. If you can't handle 30 minutes of worship here, I want to pray with you. <laughs> and more importantly, not only will I pray with you, I pray that you will seek God and pray to God to change yeah. me. Change yeah. my heart, yes. God. Change yes. my heart. I desire you. Yes. I desire to love you. And we yes. want this corporately. So please forgive me if I've offended anyone. But I want you to know to move forward, we need unity. Yeah. This is corporate. Yeah. This is our church family. Yeah. And I pray that from this day on, there will be no one complaining about the volume or whatever else it is that you don't like yourself.
This is what I need. That's what I'm talking about. This is what I'm talking about. I need your voice. I need your voice. You can talk to them like I can't. I need your voice. All of you, I need your voice. I need your voices. I need your voices. I will lead you, but I need your voices. Cindy came up to me. She said, uh, you're going to hear from the gray hairs this morning. So she, she asked me if she could do something. I want to give you some context for it. Uh, when I was going through the darkest season of my life, many of you know that I had some really uh, bad health issues with my kidneys and I was producing kidney stones on uh, three or four a week. It was, it was horrendous. It, was, it went on for years and I wanted to die. I sincerely did. And, and this church put on a, uh, a, a prayer meeting for me that I drug myself to. And I walked in empty and undone and really believing that God was through with me. If I didn't believe what I believe, I honestly believe I probably would have taken my own life. Because it was that long, it was that dark, it was that hopeless. And I crawled into here and I sat down there in that corner and there were a few of the gray hairs in here praying for me. And Cindy walked over to me and she said, I want to sing over you. And it's, it's prophetic. And she, she said to me something that I did not believe for one fraction of a second. She said, I know you're going through it right now, but you know what I see in you? I see you singing and dancing in front of here. <laughs> and listen, the furthest thing in my mind was to become a worship leader. I, I have no, I, it's still such a, such a stretch for me. But she saw something and she prophetically sang over the barrenness and the desolation in my life. So I'm going to have her sing over the barrenness and desolation of where you're at right now. <laughs> you may or may not believe her. You may or may not think this is weird. But she is prophesying that you're going to sing and you're going to dance in the future. You've got days coming that you've given up on. You've got dreams about to be fulfilled that you have stopped believing. And I'm going to ask, have her sing over me, or sing over you like she's saying over me. You ready? <laughs> Glory, here we go. You turned my morning into dancing, into dancing. You took off my sackcloth and you clothed me with joy. Now my soul will praise you. Oh, I will not be silent. Oh, Lord, my God, I love you all my life. Here we go, church. You turned my morning into dancing, into dancing. You took off my sackcloth and you clothed me with joy. Now my soul will praise you. Oh, I will not be silent. Oh, Lord, my God, I'll praise you. Oh, Lord, my God, I'll love you. Oh, Lord, my God, I'll serve you all my life. Yeah. What a God! What a God we serve! Hallelujah! 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 <laughs> what a God we serve! Praise the yes. church! Yes! He's yes, God! Praise. Yes, God! Hallelujah, Jesus! Glory to God! Hallelujah, Jesus! What a God! So, God, teach us to worship. Teach us to worship. Come on, church, raise your hands. Teach me to worship. Teach me how to worship you with my life. Teach me how to be a living sacrifice. Teach me how to be fully yours, God. Teach me how to sing in desolation and barrenness. Birth inside of me, birth inside of us. All that you have placed here, God, in this room, you have given outlandish dreams. Glory to be had. Teach us to worship in it. Teach us, God to praise your name and see those dreams come to pass. Teach us to be a worshiping church. Teach us, Jesus. I, I debated whether or not I was going to tell you this because I don't have a whole lot of details to give you just yet, but one of the things that God is really putting on my heart is to, to create a space and a place to encounter God. We, we, those of us who grew up in church, we always have these awesome stories to tell about you know, those, those childhood prayer meetings where we just wait in the presence of God and we worship and we pray and we be in that presence would be thick. Mountain View is going to start doing that again. Mountain View will leave a place and a space for encountering God because I think that your life is going to forever change in those encounters. I know your life is going to forever change in those encounters. 
get ready. We're going someplace. And this is going to be fun. This is going to be fun. So, Father God, bless my brothers and sisters. Bless them with worship. Bless them, Jesus, with your presence. Bless them with encounter. Bless the barren places with fruitfulness. Bless the dark places with glorious lights. Bless the morning with dancing, with singing, with extolling you in worship and glory and praise. All for your name. All for the name of Jesus Christ, which is lifted high above all time, above all circumstances, for now and forever. The matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Go on, worshipers.